thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank the sponsors for this opportunity. It really is an honor to be able to um, address you today. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity just to thank the, um, uh, the people from Life Technologies Applied Biosystems in South Africa. We have an amazing team there who have really helped us um, with a lot of our problems, and I don't believe we would have been able to do what we do without their support, so I'm taking this opportunity to thank them as well. Now, just to step back a bit, and I'm sure for most of you this will be going back in time. Um, obviously, with the human identification systems, they are a lot more sophisticated than where we are with animals at this stage, particularly with wildlife. So I'm sure it's going to be uh, going down memory lane for you, and hopefully a little bit of an African safari as well. Um, I am from the University of Pretoria. We are based in Pretoria, South Africa. Um, our rhinoceros project was named RODIS for obvious reasons. It's based on CODIS. The idea was to have a central standard secure database of rhinoceros DNA profiles and to put all the profiles of the entire species onto this one single database. The database consists of forensic DNA profiles, so it's case work samples, as well as routine profiles. So it's from live animals, from stockpiled horns, from hunted animals. So we'd have both of these on a single database. And the whole idea was then to get the entire population of rhinoceros onto the single database. It's a microsatellite or SDR based um, DNA profiling that we use and that we then collect onto the RODIS database. Just some of the history of this, how it came about. I'm actually trained as a veterinarian, so genetics and forensics came later in the process. So this is, this is a big learning experience for all of us, and certainly being at a meeting like this teaches us a lot more and shows us where we need to go in the future. Um, we held a, a wildlife DNA forensics course in 2007 in South Africa, where we had forensic experts come out and train us to uh, how to handle forensic casework samples. And at that point, we identified a project theme where we decided to do something that had never been done anywhere in the world before, and that is to do a unique individual identification from rhinoceros horn. People believed that rhinoceros horn was just a big clump of hair, therefore you couldn't actually do a nuclear DNA fingerprint from that. So we decided that would be our project. Uh, we completed it successfully. Um, it's sandparks approved, which means South African National Parks actually supplied us with the samples of rhinoceros horn and tissue to do this project. And we managed to get complete nuclear DNA fingerprints out of rhinoceros horn, so a successful um, completion of the project. That uh, occurred in the late 2009, and I presented these results. But in 2009, there wasn't really a rhinoceros poaching problem yet. This only really started in 2010. So at that stage, nobody even listened. Nobody was interested in the results. But then early in 2010, people started realizing that there was an increasing number of rhinoceros poaching incidents occurring. And in early 2010, I was approached by the investigators in the Kruger National Park and invited to attend my first rhino poaching crime scene. And there is a photograph of exactly that scene. It was a rhino cow and a calf that were killed at the same time, and the horns were removed. Um, they had heard about the work that we do, and they were obviously very interested for obvious reasons, because now we could match the horns that have been taken off the animal were uh, in the hands of either the poachers or even the traffickers, or even in consumer countries, and we could match those horns back to the carcass. So that was a very important tool for the investigators to use. Then in June 2010, which was very early on in the whole process, we actually had our first successful case of linking horns that were found in the hands of a trafficker who was trying to smuggle the horns out through our international airport, our um, Oliver Tambo Airport. And these horns we matched back to carcasses of rhinos that had been killed on a private game farm. So a very early success. And as a result of the DNA typing, the DNA matching, which, which of course played a part um, in the case, 
This person got a 10 year sentence, which at that stage was a very big sentence for rhino horn trafficking. We also then, in June 2010, made a decision that we would populate this database with as many rhinos as possible. And we also decided to call the database RODIS at that stage. Uh, things have progressed, of course, over time. Um, and in April 2012, legislation was passed in South Africa that every single rhino that is darted, moved, hunted, um, worked with in any way, DNA samples would be taken from that animal and would be added to the RODIS database. So it's actually now written into law in South Africa. And then in March 2013, CITES, um, in their conference of the parties in Bangkok, made a decision and put it in their final report that countries that are either um, transit countries, so some of the European countries, transit countries, also consumer countries where these horns or rhino products are found, need to sample those products and um, provide those profiles, provide samples to the RODIS database for cross-matching. Just to give you some background, I know that I don't think there are any people from South Africa here. I thought I'd just give you an idea of the species that we're actually working on. Um, I'm sure most of you know what rhinoceros are, but just in case, there are two species. Uh, that we work with that go onto the RODIS database. Um, they are the African rhino. We have the black rhino, uh, which has a hooked lip. You can see that there. Um, and a unique feature of the black rhino is the little baby black rhino always runs behind the mother. So that's one way you can identify them as well. But if you look at those numbers, in the early 1900s, we had over 850,000 black rhino across Africa. By 1960, there were about 100,000. By 1995, so it's about 35 years, there were only 2,400. So 96% decline in the species. As a result of, at that stage, it was legal hunting. So it was just uncontrolled hunting with poaching in between. Um, then, of course, a big process of trying to predict the species started. So by 2013, there were about 5,000 of these animals. And this increase occurred only in two countries, uh, Namibia and South Africa. So still the numbers are very low. Uh, it's a highly threatened species, but at least numbers are increasing slowly. But unfortunately, this is being um, counteracted by the poaching activities. The subspecies of black rhino, there are three subspecies, the bicornis, which we find in Namibia and northern South Africa. There are about 1,700 of the um, bicornis subspecies left in the world. The um, bicornis minor, which is the South African and Zimbabwean subspecies, about 1,900 of them. And then the Michele, there are approximately 700. These are just approximate numbers. Um, the numbers also change pretty rapidly depending on how much poaching there are in different areas. And then there's the Longipes, which is the western um, black rhino subspecies, which unfortunately was declared extinct in 2011. Then the white rhino, there are only two subspecies left. It's the southern white rhino, of which there are now 18,000, so that's the most numerous rhinoceros species on the planet. And these are, are global figures. So this is not just a single country. This is all the animals left in the world. The northern white rhino, um, there are only five left. Four of them are in Kenya, and one is in the San Diego Zoo. And these animals are all too old to breed at this stage, so they're practically an extinct subspecies as well. Let me just go back to the white rhino. You'll see there it has a very wide lip. And in Dutch, um, it's called veit, and that's where the white comes from. Neither one of them is actually white or black. So uh, white was after veit, and that name just stuck with it. You'll also notice in the white rhino, the little baby always runs in, fright, in front of the mother. So that's how you'll recognize a white rhino. All right, the history of the white rhino, which may give you some idea of the genetics of this species and how difficult it is to to um, do forensics on this type of animal. 
1895, the numbers dropped down to about 20 to 50. That's all that was left globally of this particular species. And they were left in KwaZulu-Natal, which is an area in, um, in South Africa, which I've just highlighted there. Then in 19, oh, 1897, the South African parks decided to turn that area into a game reserve, so these animals were protected. And through a very big conservationist, very big effort, um, some of these animals, when the numbers had increased slightly, were moved to zoos all over the world, and they were moved onto private farms where they started breeding them intensively. Um, and at this stage, well, 2012, and, and practically the same numbers now, we have about 18,000 of the southern white rhinos. So you can see from, from between 20 to 50, um, these have increased to over 18,000. So it's a really big increase from a small founder population. So unfortunately, the genetic diversity of these animals is very low. 98% of this population is also in South Africa. So one of the reasons why the Rhodes database is being managed by South Africa at this stage. Okay, where are we now with the database? Well, total numbers of animals on the database since June 2010 has grown to 15,000. So pretty good representation of the actual population numbers, um, which of course is also important in terms of uh, forensic and, and matching. Um, these numbers include live animals, dead animals, and also stockpiled horns from the rhinoceros. We have samples not only from South Africa, but also from Namibia. They test all their rhinos, put all their DNA profiles on the Rhodes database. Um, Zimbabwe does the same, Malawi, Swaziland, Botswana, Zambia, and also Kenya. Um, and Kenya we have an MOU with to develop this science further and to, ve to develop their forensic laboratory as well. So they are our first partner laboratory to be doing a similar kind of testing to upload to the Rhodes database. So we have practically covered the entire African continent um, with DNA profiles from rhinoceros. So looking at the entire population of African rhinoceros on one database. Just to give you some idea of the number of cases, how they have increased over time. In 2010, we had 22 cases. In 2014, we had over 1,000 cases. Um, and for a very small laboratory with very, very limited funding. Um, if funding is very limited for human forensic work, then funding is extremely limited for animal forensic work. Um, and we have about uh, five people now working on that sort of caseload in this laboratory. So it's, it's pretty um, difficult work. Our freezers are constantly full as well. That's sort of a freezer full of samples is what will arrive at one time. So what Rhodes does, the main aim of the Rhodes database is basically to match back either your horns back to the carcass, um, pieces of product from the animal back to the carcass, or even tools found at the crime scenes. Obviously, they'll use axes and pangas and knives and hacksaws and chainsaws to chop off the horns off the animals. And it is possible to match back these pieces of equipment with rhino blood on them back to a specific carcass and then put the um, poachers back at the uh, uh, um, crime scene. All right, just to give you some idea of the numbers of rhinos poached and how enormous this problem actually is, 2007, there were only 13 rhinos poached. So again, it was pre the big problem starting. By 2010, there were 333 poached. So you can see a small increase there. By 2014, last year, we had 1,215 rhinos killed during that year which is an enormous number if you consider the population size. It is practically out of control now, and unfortunately the decline is not matching the reproduction rate. So we are steadily going towards a state of extinction for the rhino. The arrests of poachers in South Africa has also increased. Um, it's definitely a crime driven by greed, so there are a lot of people involved in this, very difficult to control. Um, 2014, we had 344 poachers arrested. 
Now, as you'll see, there are different levels um, of poachers or people involved in the rhino poaching syndicates described there. From level one to five, these are how they are graded. Level one is your poacher which comes into the reserve and then kills the animal. So the 344 represent that level one poacher. As you go up the chain, from the poacher, the horns are given to an intermediary who will then take the horns to a third person who is then the exporter who will basically make sure that the horns are taken across to the consumer country where you will then have the buyers who um, consume the horn or utilize the horn. So you'll go up the chain to level five, which is your international buyer. Um, and unfortunately, at this point, we have not been able to, with any of the investigations, been able to actually prosecute any of the level five offenders. And that's where international cooperation becomes extremely important. Um, you can also see with the graph at the bottom, the poaching rate has increased, the arrest rate has increased similarly, but the, the distance between the poaching rate and the arrest rate is also increasing, unfortunately. So you can ask, why is this happening? Why is rhinoceros horn such an important issue? Well, that headline basically says it all. It's like cocaine minus the risk. So this is a very low-risk, high-reward criminal activity, and rhino horn has become the most valuable illegally traded commodity in the world now. It is also important because the same criminal syndicates involved in rhino horn trafficking are involved in human trafficking, all kinds of other illegal activity, and there is even talk that international terrorism um, utilizes funds which they make of rhinoceros horn and ivory trafficking to fund their organization. So it becomes very important, very high level uh, illegal criminal activity. So why rhinoceros horn? Well, it was initially part of um, traditional Asian medicine which it was used to cure fever, poisoning, liver problems, all kinds of ailments. But this isn't the fundamental use of rhinoceros horn anymore. Uh, things have changed slightly. There was a rumor in Vietnam a couple of years ago which said that rhinoceros horn would cure cancer. And this caused a very big increase in the utilization of rhino horn because Vietnam also happens to have the highest mortality rate um, for cancer, which is 73%, and very little access to Western medicine or Western ways of treating cancer. So the use of rhinoceros horn in Vietnam increased exponentially. But things again have moved away from that, and what has happened now is that rhino horn has become a status symbol in the consumer countries, um, which as far as the uh, investigations have gone, Vietnam is the most important consumer country, followed by China. The status symbol basically means that the horns are now bought, similar to Ferraris, to any form of important, important expensive item, and they're utilized as expensive presents between friends. Rhino horn is also used um, within alcoholic drinks that people consume because they say it makes people um, able to drink more alcohol without having the effects of it. So it's a party drug of choice. Um, and you'll also notice in that picture the uh, ornaments that are being carved from rhinoceros horn are also increasing now and increasing in value. And according to journalists who are actually working in the field are quite readily available if you know where to look for them. So, coming back to the science of this all, how did we manage to get a nuclear DNA profile from the rhino horn? Well, the most important reason is horn is not hair. So that will give you some clue. Rhinoceros horn is made up of cellular tubules, which grow from the base of the skin of the nose of the rhino up to the tip of the horn. So you'll have cellular tubules all the way through the horn. What that basically means is that you can as you well know, because there are cells all the way, get a complete nuclear DNA profile anywhere from the base of the horn to the tip of the horn. So these tubules are stuck together with a matrix which consists of melanin in the middle, that dark part in the middle of the horn, which protects it from sunlight, and calcium, which makes it very hard. 
The horn also does not have a bony core. There's no bone inside it. So you'll notice on that picture, that is the rhinoceros whose horn is being removed. Um, and this happens very often now. It's actually a mechanism to try and protect the rhino. People will um, dehorn their rhinos, and it takes about three years for the horn to grow back completely again. So you can utilize the horn off the live animal, and it has no effect on the animal whatsoever. Um, the method we use to extract the DNA from the rhino horn is the PrEP Filer Forensic DNA Extraction Kit. Um, and we use a magnetic particle processor, so it's a semi-automated um, method, and that was published in FSI Genetics in 2013. A rhinoceros horn is actually a very easy sample to work with, um, and it holds DNA for a very, very long time. So it does not degrade at all within the actual horn. Um, and you'll see there the oldest actual horn that we've sampled is a animal that was shot in the Sudan in 1938. That horn was actually over a metre long. We took samples from it and we got complete DNA profile of that. Then we got an even older sample, a walking stick made of rhinoceros horn from 1888. We took a sample from that and got a complete DNA profile. So you can really keep rhinoceros horn forever and the DNA will remain completely intact. We did some experimental work um, to show how little horn you could actually use for the, um, for the test. And we went from 25 um, milligrams down to 0.1 milligrams in this experimental work and were able to get good quality DNA profiles all the way down to the smallest volume. Um, this was particularly important in one of the case work um, examples that we did. One of the investigators found some bags in the car of a person that they arrested um, on their way, having delivered the horns already. So the person had three million rand, um, which I think is about 300,000 euros, in the back of their car, but no rhinoceros horn. Those had already been given to the middleman. And in the car were just some bags, which the investigator then went and dusted out onto some paper, brought it to the lab, and we actually looked under a microscope and collected some samples under the microscope, which appeared to be rhinoceros horn. We extracted this using our normal method and were able to get two complete DNA profiles from those samples, which we then matched back to rhinoceros that had been killed in the Kruger National Park. So it really is a very, very easy and good material to work with in terms of DNA extraction and very powerful in terms of trace evidence. Um, the best area to sample, obviously you can utilize pretty much anywhere in the horn except the very, very outside parts. Um, but the best area we found with this experimental work, we used a black horn and a white horn and drilled holes all the way, um, was actually the, the very middle part of the horn where you have the black area. Um, that gives you the best DNA quality. Taking samples from rhinoceros horn, um, and that's for any laboratories who could potentially be involved in the process of collecting the samples of the horn. Um, as I said, from the middle of the horn is the best place to take the sample. And what we usually do is you just take a drilling from the middle and you'll get those, um, for want of a specific scientific term, squiggles coming out, and those will give you the, the best sample for DNA extraction. What we then also do, as I said before, we can match back certain evidence items back to a crime scene and put the person who had the items on them back to the scene. What we use is the Blue Star Forensic Latent Blood Reagent. Um, and we've actually found this to be very useful and without actually inhibiting any of the DNA. Um, so we have been able to successfully match a number of uh, pieces of equipment back to crime scenes and this has been through our court process as well. And what we've actually found is that you can spray with Blue Star twice. So the investigator has sprayed a car for instance and found pieces of um, evidence items in the car and brought them to the laboratory. We've sprayed them again and then sampled and still been able to get full DNA profiles which we could then link back to specific carcasses. We're also involved in the field sample collection, so um, I will go out quite regularly 
um, and collect samples from live rhinos. Obviously, it's very good quality samples. We have hair samples. Uh, we have tissue samples from notches cut, cut into the ears of the rhinos to identify them. And we have good quality blood samples. So really good quality samples for DNA profiling. The database itself, um, genotyping data that we put onto the database is automatically flagged for any new alleles, which unfortunately doesn't happen very often, but it does flag them. Um, we use 24 SDRs at this stage for our DNA profiling system. And we are busy developing um, more robust, better quality marker systems. And we have partnership with Applied Biosystems or Life Technologies to develop this and, and internationalize the test kit as well. Obviously with animal testing, with wild animal testing, there are no test kits. There's nothing to buy commercially. But we are working in developing this particular commercial kit to be able to distribute internationally for um, testing of products wherever they may end up in the world. So that is in development. Uh, next generation sequencing, well, I would imagine that's a very distant future. It was certainly an eye-opener to see this here and something we could think about but would need a lot of funding and I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, in our profiling test, we have markers which are monomorphic and unique to either black or white uh, species. So we can, through our DNA profiling test, not only give a, an individual fingerprint, but also say whether the horn comes from a white or a black rhinoceros. Match probability calculations. Um, unfortunately, genetic variation is very low, particularly in white rhinoceros, so this is always a, a problem. But we find anywhere in the region of one to hundreds of thousands and one to millions with the test that we've got now. And if you consider the population size, that is quite adequate for court purposes. And fortunately, we also have a very large representative database, very representative of the population, which certainly helps. Um, those are the SDRs that we use. Um, again, we don't have the advantage of having a full genome available. The white rhinoceros genome has been done, but it hasn't been annotated and hasn't been assembled. So we only have the scaffolds. What we have done is to place the markers that we use currently um, as well as the new markers that we have under development on the different scaffolds, and we have used a reference assistant chromosome assembly using the horse genome as our reference to actually place those on sp the markers on specific chromosomes. And there is mostly no overlap, with a couple of markers showing some overlap. Um, included in our G uh, DNA profile, we also have a gender test, so we can say whether the horn was from a male or a female rhinoceros, and that is simply using the zinc finger protein um, with a seven base pair difference in the X and the Y chromosome. So that's quite um, simple and easy to put into the profile. So we've got that information out of it as well. What we have also found, um, and I'm sure that's generally a problem, is that our investigators aren't always familiar with DNA profiling and with the kind of samples that you need to really get good profiles from your sample. So we've had to actually go out, make specific kits that we could supply to our investigators in the field to assist them in collecting proper samples um, and also to assist them with chain of custody from the carcass to the laboratory. So what we've done is we've put together the kits. They have an outside bag, which is a sealed forensic evidence bag. Inside this bag, we have all the equipment they need to collect proper samples from the, from the rhino carcass, and another unsealed forensic bag. So they'll go out into the field, collect their samples in pre-barcode labeled, labeled tubes, put them into the second bag, close up, seal the bag at the carcass, and then send it into the laboratory. And we found that we now have much better quality, much better sized samples, and um, the chain of custody is intact from the carcass to the laboratory. Previously, we used to have the ear of the rhino, the tail of the rhino, and half the rhino in between, just for a DNA profile. So we've really had to educate them over time. What we have also done is to develop an eroder system. So this is to collect your field data so when you're at the carcass doing your crime scene investigation, you'll collect all the data electronically on an app. Um, 
which we have called eRODIS, so that when the sample arrives at the laboratory, we do not have to retype any of this data. So this is from the live animal and from the dead animal and from the horn stockpiles. So that makes it much more simple in the laboratory. We'll just upload this data immediately and automatically to the database. What we have also done is to incorporate training into this whole RODIS system, and we will go out into the field and train people how to collect the samples properly as part of the entire crime scene investigation. So we work very closely with our police services, with our environmental inspectors, and they, they basically make collection of evidence part of the whole crime scene training, and that has really supported us in providing us with much better quality samples. And has also created a very close bond between us as the testing laboratory and the investigators in the field who investigate rhino crimes. Then just um, one of the examples, and we've had several cases like this, um, Zimbabwean poacher, who had been active in Zimbabwe for many years and was never caught there, came into South Africa, poached three rhinos on a private reserve, he was caught near Pretoria with um, three rhinoceros horns in a bag. And um, he was arrested on the 16th of January 2012. They brought the horns into us. We collected the samples, did the DNA profiling, matched the horns back to the carcasses. And this person was sentenced on the 27th of Nove November 2012 to 10 years imprisonment. So for us, that's extremely important. Every successful case means that what we're doing is actually having a benefit. Just some international cases, and I think that's where we're moving towards. Um, catching poachers locally, unfortunately, makes a very small difference, because for every poacher that's caught and put in jail, there are probably 300 more waiting to poach more rhinoceros. Um, but when it comes to international cases, this is where it's really important, where um, uh, prosecuting traffickers, and hopefully at some point the um, dealers of rhinoceros horn will become the ultimate uh, role that this database can play. Vietnam, a Vietnamese uh, man who was uh, captured in Singapore in January 2014 with a uh, rhinoceros horn in his possession. Um, some of these horns were matched back to two carcasses in South Africa. The one was in KwaZulu-Natal, the other was in the Kruger National Park, and there is a picture of the actual carcass in the Kruger National Park that this rhinoceros horn was matched back to. Unfortunately, this person only got 15 months in jail, and nothing further has happened in terms of the international use of the DNA tool. So hopefully that is something that can be developed and will increase in future. As you can also see, our crime scenes probably don't look quite similar to human crime scenes, and we have some other factors that play an important role, including lions on our hyenas and vultures who take the crime scene apart. So in the end, DNA becomes one of the most important tools that you can utilize because that's practically all that's left. Um, and then I'd just like to end off by saying that I would like to dedicate this particular talk to all the amazing people who work tirelessly in the field to investigate rhinoceros poaching and who risk their lives to stop and apprehend the criminals involved in this. They do all this to save the animals from an extremely cruel death and from a very real risk of complete extinction at very small reward for themselves. So thank you very much. <laughs>